morning, um, everyone. Uh, and you're all very welcome to our uh, Boost for Health Deep Dive webinar into the Irish Life Sciences Ecosystem and the Irish Healthcare System. And this is uh, an Interreg Northwest Europe event. Um, my name is Eunan Cunningham. I'm from Westwick, uh, the Business Innovation Centre for the West and the Northwest of Ireland. And I'll be your host for today. Um, we in Westwick, we deliver high quality investor ready enterprise development support to innovative high growth startups and scale ups in our region, uh, many of which are life science and med tech companies. Um, and we are one of the 11 partners in the Boost for Health program from seven European countries. Uh, and you'll hear a bit more about that from Ria shortly. Just a few housekeeping matters. Um, this meeting is recorded. Um, the presentations will be made available afterwards to participants. Um, your mics are muted, um, but please put your questions in the Q&A chat, not in the, not in the other one, but in the Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. And uh, we'll make every effort to put your questions to the speakers. And any questions we don't get to, we'll endeavor to respond to them afterwards. Uh, and then the last section, which I wouldn't like any of you to miss uh, in today's meeting, is a short opportunity for SMEs and service providers to make their short 30-second pitches to the audience. Um, and just to let you know that this meeting was originally scheduled to take place in Galway, uh, in the west of Ireland, where we'd planned to extend a warm welcome to our European partners. Uh, but we were forced by COVID-19 to have this event online. And the plan at that time, and it still is, uh, was to present the Irish life science uh, ecosystem and an overview of the Irish healthcare system to our, to our partners. And to try and make connections as well between Irish SMEs and uh, service providers and their counterparts in the countries uh, that are participating in this program, which are France and Germany, Netherlands, Spain, Belgium, and the UK, and of course ourselves in Ireland. So if you're a life science uh, med tech SME from any of these countries or indeed a service provider from any of those countries, uh, you're in the right place. Um, so without any further ado, I'll start with our first uh, speaker and uh, I'll introduce you to Ria, who some of you might have heard speaking a minute ago, uh, who is the program manager of life sciences and health at Brabant Development Agency in the Netherlands. Um, and she's also project leader uh, for this Boost for Health Interreg program. Uh, so Ria will provide an overview of the project. So I'll hand over to you, Ria. Thanks. Thank you very much. I will try to share my screen. Um, okay, I think uh, you should stop sharing your yeah, screen because Neve, otherwise Neve, I cannot. Neve needs to, yeah, Neve needs to unshare. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, th very, thank you very much for uh, the nice introduction. And you already uh, mentioned some uh, interesting things about the Boost for Health project. Um, well, I still cannot share my screen because yeah. the basic screen is yeah. still shared. Neve, can you can you um yeah can you unshare the the uh, yeah, yeah ah, that's great. The one. okay Thanks. perfect uh, let's see because now I have a different view it's always a challenge with this uh, technology stuff and uh, see how it works well now is something happening if it's correct you can see my screen uh, I want to have a full screen the but yeah okay there it is. But yeah. now it starts at the end. <laughs> That's not what I want. Uh, wait, wait eh? go to the top. Because, well, I have a very short presentation, but not that short. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, you already mentioned the participating uh, countries in the Boost for Health project. Eh? Uh, to introduce myself, you could also read it on the website. I'm working at the Brabant Development Agency in the south of the Netherlands. Um, and working already for a long time also in European projects. And what we try to achieve is to help our uh, companies in our region to get uh, cross-border and international uh, connections. Uh, sometimes in a region, yeah, there is an SME and they want to work together with a, a knowledge provider or, or with someone who can just deliver disposables or has some different questions and cannot find it in their own region or can find it in their own region, but maybe sometimes it's too expensive or they have specific qualities they are looking for. So then the Boost for Health project comes in because maybe we can help with a, another part, partner and with a little bit of an incentive, uh, yeah, people can start collaborate. Um, so these are the re regions who are involved. And if you are an SME in one of these regions, then you can apply for a voucher. 
and you can work together with service providers in the whole Northwest Europe. So in France, in Germany, in the whole countries where the regions are located. So that's good to know. Uh, and what we try to do is stimulate international growth. Yeah? So uh, especially in the life science and health sector, everyone knows it's a global sector. You should not focus on your own region or on, on your own country because sometimes uh, the amount of patients is not high enough or other obstacles. You have to look at it at a global view. We want to increase the tier one levels of uh, the companies so that those are the technology readiness level levels. That's the definition of the European Commission. Well, it's not this important at this moment, but it's it's really about getting products to the market in the end. So we want to fasten the market introduction. And we also want to aim for creating of new jobs within the SMEs we help. Um, just to be sure, I want to give some terminology and some definitions about the words we use. Uh, an SME, well, small, medium-sized enterprise, everyone knows uh, uh, it's the European definition we uh, take care of. So it's maximum 250 uh, FTE uh, persons in a company. Um, a service provider is an organization that provides a service. Eh? So that's actually uh, a word we come up with ourselves, but it's, a, it's a, a collaboration partner in another region. The growth intermediary is uh, our local contact person. So that's me for Brabant and that's Union for uh, the, the part of Ireland. But eh, there are also other local contact persons. You can all find them on our Boost for Health website. Here you can find also the website uh, address, boostforhealth.eu. And you can find uh, the contacts over there. If you have a question, you can contact your own local contact person. Within Boost for Health, we have three activities. So we have, uh, well, a, a support network. We have some coaching. So we can really help one-on-one -on -one companies with their internationalization plans. We create matchmakings. Well, at the COVID times, it was a little bit more difficult, but we tried it also online. And we have some microfinancing in place uh, via vouchers. And I really want to go into the voucher part at uh, today. Uh, we have two types of vouchers. Uh, we have connection vouchers up to 500 euros, and we have support vouchers up to 1500 euros. We understand that these are not very big uh, amounts but uh, see it as a little bit of a uh, sewing money that could help you making the next step. Um, in the next slide, I will give some examples about where you can use this money for. Uh, the eligibility criteria are that you should be an SME located in one of the Boost for Health regions. So you have seen the map. So you could also see if you were one in, uh, yeah, located in these uh, regions. You should work in the field of health, biotechnology, medical technology, e-health. We have a very broad definition. And um, yeah, that's a little bit of um, yeah administrative thing. Well, these vouchers are not so very high, but if you had uh, a lot of grants in the past, then you should check that you're not above the de minimis ceiling because uh, there are regulations from Europe that as a company, you cannot receive uh, a higher amount than I think the number was 200,000 euros in the past three years. So you should check if these vouchers are not above this ceiling, but the numbers are not so high. So I think usually it should fit. If you look at the connection vouchers, they were 500 euros. You could use them to uh, pay for entrance fees for online events. I mean, that's very actual at the moment. Uh, you can also use these fees to promote the company on, uh, on the online events because sometimes you can hire a booth, eh? for example, on Medica, what's coming up, or Bio Europe uh, events. You could use this money uh, for those um, yeah, goals. Uh, when traveling is allowed again in Europe, well, this summer Europe opens, we all are hoping for that, then it's possible to visit contacts in other regions and you can declare your public transport fares. Also, uh, some car rental, etc., parking costs and accommodation costs, including breakfast. 
unfortunately not uh, food and drinks <laughs> because we cannot uh, argument that enough to uh, the interact uh, project office but uh, well breakfast <laughs> should be okay um, so the, those are the expenses you can make for these connection vouchers. Yeah, it's a, it's a small help, 500 euros, but I think it could help you getting access to contacts. The support vouchers have a little bit of a different uh, goal. What we try to achieve is that when you have a contact, that you, that you can start to learn this other contact and that you can have a little bit of a feeling, could this work together in a collaboration? Huh? So with this support vouchers, it's only 1500 euros, but you could ask for a one or two days support of a service provider in another region, depending on the hour rate, of course. And for example, you can ask them, for a more in-depth offer for the service you need. So you get a really good overview of uh, what, it, what it would cost if you would use uh, the expanded service. Eh? So that's something you could use this 1500 euros about. Or maybe ask for a, a consultant who could, could give you an overview about the new Brexit regulations, for example or you maybe will get some first insights for reimbursement in another country, or maybe some marked market insights. Well, it, it's depending on, of course, your need, but there are different possibilities. And this 1500 euros is a little bit of sobbing money to get things started. So that's the way you have to look at it, but maybe it could help you to grow to the next step. Uh, also, maybe lists of possible suppliers. Sometimes we get questions from companies. They want to start, for example, in the German market, but they really know, don't know how to start, uh, how, how the reimbursement works, uh, how, where are the distributors for specific products, and so on. So therefore, it could help, uh, be helpful as well. So when you're not located in a Boost for Health region, it's not... Uh, well, then you still have a possibility to use the vouchers, but then the other way around, then you can register as a service provider and you could, could get some business out of this. So it's also an opportunity to promote yourself internationally via the Boost for Health web website. So don't hesitate and re re register yourself as a service provider. Maybe you will be found by another SME and maybe you can get some business out of it. So this was actually my short presentation and uh, maybe someone has some questions. Yeah, th thanks a million, Ria. And uh, I'm not sure if it was my screen. There was, there was something funny with some of your slides there, but uh, oh. we, I, think, I think we got the message. Oh. You seem to be zoomed okay. up or something. But anyway, we, I think we, we got the message and, and thank you very much. And uh, anybody who has any questions, please put them in the, in the Q&A and we, you can pick them up later on maybe, Ria, if, uh, if yeah, any questions sure. come in, in, in the in the chat and I think my colleague Alison will, will uh, flag flag us if there are any questions in, in, in those chats but thank you right. very much and I think like what you mentioned we will hear some of the SMEs and service providers uh, later on uh, making their pitches and uh, maybe there's a possibility there for us to make some international collaborations yeah. and partnerships. It was, so that, it's, it's strange that the, that the slides showed funny because in my screen it was perfectly okay. <laughs> Yeah, I know. That. So it was not that I've made funny slides or something. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe it was my settings. I'm not too sure. But uh, thank you very much, Ria. Much appreciated. And, and okay. uh, we'll, we'll, we, I think we'll, just mo we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, and the next speaker is uh, Alan Hobbs, who's the manager of the High Potential Startups uh, in Life Sciences and Industrial and Enterprise Ireland. And uh, Alan is going to discuss with us uh, an introduction to the Irish life science ecosystem. So uh, the floor is yours, um, Alan. Thanks, Amelia. Thanks, Eunan. And uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Can you just confirm that the screen has been shared there? Yeah, perfect. It has. Great. Okay. So, um, yeah, I work with the uh, High Potential Startup Division of Enterprise Ireland. It's an Irish government agency, which many of the participants here will be familiar with. And we help um, start, grow, scale um, Irish companies across all sectors. Um, the team I work with in particular would look after life science and industrial clean tech, um, also consumer goods, but the vast majority of them are in the life science sector. So um, in Enterprise Ireland, we work with over 5,000 companies um, across all business uh, sectors. 
we have a budget of over half a billion. And that was uh, inflated somewhat last year because of the uh, sustaining enterprise funds provided by the EU and the Irish government to help deal with the challenges of COVID-19. Um, the companies we invest in are the most innovative companies in Ireland. And uh, the way we support companies initially is by way of equity. And we're, according to PitchBook last year, the largest VC in uh, Europe. And that's by deal number and not uh, deal amount and size. So we have a mandate to drive collaboration and commercialization of research, uh, state-funded research. And we're also the national contact point for Horizon Europe and EIC uh, European supports. We have 40 offices around the world, and we also have responsibility for remote investment in food. It's one of the anomalies of the Irish state uh, economic system. So in terms of last year, um, unfortunately, 20, 20 figures are being released by our uh, communications office this afternoon. So um, in 2019, we had quite significant growth of 8% right across the world. Um, obviously, the higher rate growths uh, in places where we have less um, exports like North America, Asia Pac. But what's reassuring there when I look at this slide is um, in the UK, where the UK historically has been um, responsible for over 50% of our exports, we've managed to kind of diversify significantly over the last eight years. And it's now down to 31%, but it's still the most important market that we have and hugely significant in light of uh, what happened through Brexit. So it continues to be a significant challenge, but overall a good story on exports and indeed jobs. So one thing that's not readily known is that Enterprise Ireland backed companies in Ireland uh, employ directly over 220,000 people. And that's quite significant because there's also a multiplier of jobs associated with those companies. And that means that in every town and village in Ireland, there are significant numbers of people employed by companies backed by Enterprise Ireland. So sometimes the indigenous sector doesn't get the recognition it deserves because we're primarily a B2B play. We don't have the big names of consumer products on our portfolios that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. So people are not as familiar with the companies that we back, but it's really important uh, the, the economic contribution that they're making right throughout the country. So what do we, how do we define a HPSU? Well, it's essentially, it's a company with an innovative product or service that has scalable potential globally. And uh, at a very minimum, we look at companies that can go to 10 jobs or a million sales within three years of corporation. That does fluctuate somewhat, especially in life science. And I know some of the participants I could see on the call here will be looking at me saying, listen, you know, we'd be lucky to have a product within three years and it's not to mind regulatory approval. So um, if we do push that bar out for life science and it tends to take a lot more cash as well to get those companies to that stage. In terms of how we finance startups, well, we have pre-seed supports like New Frontiers, which is a, an entrepreneurial development program. There's feasibility study grants, there's mentoring assistance. We have a kind of an early stage competitive start fund that's not suitable for everyone, but it's there for anyone that wants to apply. And we'll offer 50K support for 10% equity. Um, I, I, saw, I heard the, the last presenter, Ria, there talk about the vouchers and innovation vouchers, I think, is a, an initiative that we kind of stole from the, uh, the Dutch and we've made it our own because we've, uh, we've now, we roll out hundreds of these each year to try and, um, to try and, I suppose, encourage collaboration between small companies and the third level, which historically they had a, a barrier there because of the, the, the fear of working with a third level as a very small company. This breaks down that barrier and allows them to engage and get some substantial work done um, with, the, with the third level system. And then the, the core support we have is our seed round investments. And uh, again, 100K, that's very low. That would be more on the ICT side. We would operate at a much higher level than that. Um, but we go in in the form of equity. And then we also do follow on round investments, typically up to Series A. Um, but it depends on how much fuel is in the tank from our perspective and uh, the, the, the economic development agenda of the company. So when we look at investor ready, the kind of things we're looking for is really that, you know, you have a grasp of the products uh, that you're working with that has some market validation. It may not be a physical product that's ready to go, but you have the, 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 the validation of that idea. And we have a fantastic program in life science called BioInnovate run on your doorstep there unit with uh, NUIG. And that's, that's a significant clinical immersion program where we fund fellowships for up to nine months to just go in and observe observe ways of doing things better or maybe producing products that will do things better in the clinical environment and then following that if you have an idea that you think will will kind of run to commercialization we we have commercialization funding which is run through our research and innovation division 
and that's where we fund the project through the college and it gives you the freedom to work for a couple of years on really validating your idea and getting out there with the key opinion leaders to test that what you have is is really something that the market would value and that it's not just a problem looking or a solution looking for a problem it's it's something that's addressing a real unmet clinical need um, and you know the other things we look for is that you have that product roadmap you have funding in the tank for 18 months minimum our investment committee are very keen that the projects are properly funded and that you know what that uh, that journey looks like so in terms of the kind of state supported uh, mechanisms that enterprise ireland is involved with all of these and your own organization there the business incubation center is a huge importance not just on the west but down in cork and dublin and um, the southeast and they provide invaluable supports to early stage hbsus and our own division wouldn't be able to operate without the support from your own teams uh, in the business and incubation centers uh, the local enterprise office tends to be the first call for all entrepreneur entrepreneurs in ireland and the local enterprise offices are operate out through every county in ireland uh, we fund the tech transfer offices and their job is to really identify kind of commercial uh, research coming out of universities we have a new frontiers i mentioned earlier it's a national development uh, entrepreneur program and then we fund a number of regional accelerators uh, throughout the country so in terms of um, the ecosystem out there huge amount of support and a huge amount of efforts gone in to try and make the journey of an entrepreneur as easy as possible and um, there's a massive amount of support from multinationals from irish companies there's entrepreneurship entrepreneurship programs run by many, many agencies, uh, run by uh, private companies, the Dog Patch Labs, the National Research uh, Development Center, Digital Research Center, New Frontiers. Um, we also have collaboration with, I know one of the speakers coming up, Martin, very well, and uh, the HSE have been incredibly helpful to the life science sector in Ireland, um, and never more so than the last 18 months, where we've had accelerated development of innovation from a number of our portfolio companies, because they've been able to bring uh, rapid response, agile innovation into the HSE. And the guys there have been really, really good about opening the doors and validating those technologies and adopting them. So we've great companies that will help the HSE with their shift left strategy to community care, to care at the home. Companies like Blue Drop Medical, companies like Patient Empower, uh, Wallola, Novalia. There's many, many companies there that uh, the guys have been really helpful with. <clears throat> and then also our partnership with the VCs and the banks well, not so much the banks for startups, but with the VCs and with the angel network, the Halo Angel uh, Business Net, Angel Network, the MedTech syndicates, the Iris Bull, all of these guys, really, really important parts of that ecosystem. Um, so if we look at there, as I said, there's a due diligence process that we go through. So very quickly, um, we do it on three levels. It's a financial due diligence, technical and uh, commercial. So we do a deep dive into all those areas to check that the project goes uh, that stacks up and then once we have all that in place we'll bring a proposal document to our investment committee where ultimately a decision to invest rests with that committee and that committee comprises of uh, industry experts and senior executives of the uh, leadership team of enterprise ireland in terms of how we invest we do it through a standard instrument it's a bit of a mouthful it's a cumulative convertible redeemable preference share um, it's a way for us to put money against the business plan up front. So we're not asking you to spend money and then claim back grant. We can invest in the early stage when you need it most. However, if there are, well, there has to be other investors involved, but typically we will also seek to look at their uh, vehicles and their instruments and we will not be disadvantaged. So we tend to match the, uh, the, the terms, conditions and the instruments of what we would term a qualified investor. And the qualified investor is essentially somebody who invests for a living. So we, we used to use the word professional and people got upset about that because everybody uh, sees themselves as being professional. But we say qualified investor, which means somebody who invests for a living. And we tend to kind of mirror their terms and conditions. We're trying to make it as easy as possible, but we also don't want to disadvantage the state uh, as an investor. Um, OK, so that's a slide to really kind of wreck your heads out there. and That shows you the depth and the breadth of supporters out there in the ecosystem for startups everything right across the country from the banks from the vcs incubators uh, med uh, there's multinational companies there interesting a lot of multinational companies now have partnered with ei so we have uh, amazon we have uh, google uh, we have stripe um, and uh, uh, hubspot 
all offering supports for startups and helping them kind of grow, helping them access really leading edge software and marketplace systems. Not for every sector, but you know, really, really helpful supports for certain sectors. Here's some examples of some of the different support networks, the entrepreneur groups, the uh, from you know Planet Women Academy, the Next Web, Dublin Globe, Startup Ireland, and that that's really important. And there's a new website that we've launched called startinireland.com, which is going to help you navigate the support network because, as you can see from those slides, it's really, really confusing. And the startinireland.com website will allow you to plug in the kind of company you are, the sector you operate in, the geography you're located in, and it should throw up a lot of solutions or uh, suggestions for people that you need to engage with. So just very quickly, the startup sector in Ireland, we do about 90 investments a year. So it is about 30% in the broader industrial life sciences, 60 odd percent software fintech. And then in terms of where um, uh, startups come from, we get a lot of professionals coming out of multinationals, overseas multinationals based here. We have 40% of thereabouts from indigenous Irish companies spinning out. Uh, we get about 15% from overseas and 12% from the third level. So a good mix of uh, projects and uh, sources of entrepreneurs there. So I'll stop there, Yunan, and happy, uh, like we and the other speakers, maybe to take questions later or now or whenever, whenever you think it's uh, the best. Okay, Alan, um, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, that was fantastic. You, you squeezed an awful lot into a, a short time there. Um, interesting to see that collaboration with the HSE, and we, we'll hear Martin very shortly. And um, and uh, the other thing is, I think what you showed there will give our partners in Europe an idea of what the Irish ecosystem looks like. And uh, it is quite an ecosystem to navigate. And we'll hear from Andrew later on as to how he managed to navigate some of, some of that. But uh, that was very interesting. There were, I think there was one question in the chat from uh, uh, Margot in Germany. And, and uh, Margot asks, uh, I assume the grants from Enterprise Ireland are dedicated to Irish startups only. Um, no, um, it depends how you define an Irish startup. So, you know, Margo, we, we'd be delighted to talk to you if you're willing to move your business to Ireland. So we, we also fund international startups that move their business to Ireland. Um, we're not asking you to display something, but we're asking you to start in Ireland. So for companies with less than 10 people, uh, typically it's less than five. So it's usually a founder or two and a couple of first employees. If they're kind of open to maybe setting up their business here, and growing their business out of Ireland, but then we can certainly consider it. So what we look for is essentially the control and the risk-taking that has to be in Ireland. You know, many of our companies have foreign investors, so technically they're foreign-owned. However, the CEO, the founder, the CTO, the CMO, COO are based in Ireland. We consider them an Irish company, and we can, we can invest in those companies also. Okay, th thanks a million, um, Alan. And one, one other question. Uh, Yes, Margaret says, thanks, good to know. And uh, one other question from Eva is, will the slides be provided to the participants of the webinar? So yeah, with, with, the, um, sure. with the speaker's permission, we, we will provide uh, all of the slides afterwards to the participants. Um, so for the moment, they're the only questions in the chat. So thanks again, Alan. And uh, I'll just, I'll move swiftly on to the, to the next speaker. Um, and uh, the next speaker is, going to talk about the Irish healthcare system and uh, we have Martin Curley who's the director of the digital transformation and open innovation at the health service executive here in Ireland the HSE and he's just going to talk about understanding the Irish healthcare system so the floor is yours Martin. Great uh, you know actually I cannot yet uh, share my screen maybe Alan if you could transfer okay transfer control to me. Okay, okay, I think Alan has unshared his screen, so you should be able to share, yeah. Right, can I just check um, that everybody can see my screen? Okay, yeah, we can see, yeah, yes. Yes. Yeah, I yeah. Think we're on. Right, okay. So thanks, Ria and Alan, for, for a great presentation. So I want to do quickly introduce um, the Irish healthcare system and specifically what we're doing around digital transformation system and uh, we collaborate very closely with Enterprise Ireland and, and Alan and his team and we're, we're very grateful for that uh, collaboration. So I'll, I'll move very quickly through my slides. So uh, healthcare is on average about a decade behind um, other industries in digitalizing 
and Ireland itself actually is two or three years behind kind of mainstream Europe. So we have a, a lot of catch up to do. Uh, but in that context, we have a lot of disruptive technologies all showing up at the same time from cloud to mobile and social to the internet of things to big data to machine learning and artificial intelligence to blockchain. And all this is leading to a perfect storm. So there's a really big opportunity to grasp these technologies and transform healthcare. Uh, <clears throat> so what we're doing in Ireland is we have a leapfrog strategy. Uh, right now we're over on the left-hand side of this screen where we have a system that's pay primarily paper-based. It's presence-based. You have to go to a hospital to have care. Uh, and all the care is primarily based in our acute hospitals. Uh, we want to leapfrog sort of the installation of big monolithic electronic health records. And we want to leap to a system that is digital, that is home and community based, that is data based, it's based on remote monitoring. It's based on proactive and predictive healthcare, it's cloud based, is, is open source where possible, is integrated, is social, it's mobile and it's AI enabled. And the fact is, we think that actually the overall cost of the healthcare system, if we adopt this approach, will be significantly lower than the current cost of maintaining the systems. So we've built a roadmap, um, the Digital Health Capability and Maturity Framework, and we're actually working with Enterprise Ireland to build this out. And, and we started actually at level one, at a very basic level. And through COVID, we reckon that we have lifted one maturity level but our goal by 2025 or early 2026 is to be the European leader in, in digital healthcare. And we, we note that the Dutch are very much um, uh, considered a leader our, our, as are Estonia, but we've been collaborating with um, uh, some Dutch government officials to see how we might be able to share and accelerate our progress. So we have five pillars to our digital innovation strategy. Uh, I'll just note some highlights. We have a digital transformation strategy developed. I'm going to share that with you because it will be important, particularly for the SMEs that want to partner with us and sell to us. Uh, we've created a master's in digital health transformation where we primarily have doctors and nurses and physicians and uh, pharmacists and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, learning about digital health. And the most important part of this is that they're developing digital change projects. And we, we've just had our first uh, graduates from that program. And we had 21 digital change projects uh, developed as part of the masters and 80, 18 of them are viable and actually are moving ahead to implementation if not already implemented. Uh, we have a digital innovation portfolio of greater than 50 disruptive technologies that we're managing. I'll, and I'll be encouraging the SMEs uh, on this call to submit their solutions and proposal to us uh, later on in my presentation. We have 15 living labs in place. We have a strategy called Stay Left, Shift Left, which I'll share in a second. And we also run a quarterly digital academy forum where we share and spread and solutionize new digital solutions. So the HSE is responsible for del healthcare delivery in Ireland. Uh, there are about 130,000 employees, both direct and indirect employees. But previously it was impenetrable. It was absolutely impossible, particularly for Irish SMEs to sell in, into the HSE, never mind uh, partnering. Well, we've taken a new approach. We've adopted an approach called Open Innovation 2.0. I wrote a book on this a couple of years ago with a colleague from the European Commission. And we've act actively started to stimulate a system and we're really starting to get uh, results. We won the um, global award from the International Chambers of Commerce for public sector innovation last year. And we won a number of awards in the um, Irish Healthcare Award. So we're starting to see results. Our overall strategy is something we call stay left, shift left. Stay left is about using technology to keep well people well in their homes, or if you happen to have a chronic condition, you can be managed best of all from home. Shift left is about moving uh, patients as quickly as possible from an acute to a community to a home setting. Uh, and each time we look at digital in a, in, in interventions, we're trying to improve four characteristics or four vectors. We want to reduce the cost of care, improve the quality of care, 
improve quality of life and improve clinician experience. And all the time uh, we're doing this, we're very often seeing at least three of those four vectors are improved. So here's just a snapshot of some of the companies that we're working with. You'll notice that actually the critical mass of the companies we work with are on the left-hand side of this. So they're home community-based solutions. But we also have um, other solutions, very significant solutions. And just to highlight one solution, we're working with a, an AI company called um, Syncrify, and we're delivering vital science automation. And, and currently we have a significant living lab in Cavan, and we hope to roll out this technology um, to the RCSI group and then nationally over the next year and a half. Uh, we have a vibrant um, ecosystem working with large and small companies um, and we found this to be equally valuable but with smaller companies they tend to be more agile and we can actually move more quickly. Uh, so we have created a network of uh, what we call digital living labs um, across the country and that's from sort of Northern Ireland Union in your territory and Letterkenny for example where we are developing a registry for um, emergency general surgery patients and hoping to create an AI system that will for, inform surgeons in real time and help guide a decision whether they need to operate or, or, or not. And across the country, we have different living labs and I'll give some examples now in a second. Uh, we manage an innovation funnel. Uh, technologies go uh, across four phases, the exploration phase, the proof of concept phase, the demonstrator phase, and a finally broad adoption. Just to show how COVID has been an accelerator for us, this is what our funnel looked like pre-COVID. And this is what it looks like right now. Uh, so it's heavily populated and we found COVID being a real enabler and accelerator for digital innovation. So just a couple of examples of the innovations and the companies we, we've worked with. So we worked with a company called Patient Empower. So within the first week of COVID, when we just had um, 30, 33 cases, uh, we were able to co-design a solution for remote monitoring of COVID. And just five weeks later, we had the solution deployed across the country. And typically an innovation like this in the past might have taken two to two and a half years to be proliferated across the country, but we got broad adoption within five weeks. Uh, so that's a, a, a small Irish SME called Patient Empower. Uh, similarly, around the same time, we introduced the technology from an Irish company called PMD Solutions into uh, Bowmount Hospital, and we created a living lab there. And the idea is that we could wirelessly transmit um, respiration rate uh, from, uh, from the patient's bedside to a nurse's station and they could look at the trends for the respiration rate and importantly for COVID we, we were able to uh, produce clinical data that showed having the system in place gave us 12 hours notice of a, a hypoxic event with a patient when a patient would seriously deteriorate. Uh, so we're now almost completed in rolling out uh, this technology to all the acute hospitals. And again, a program like this in the past might have taken three years to, um, um, you know, be d d adopted nationally. And we, we, we've gone from two sites, Cork and Bowmount, to 25 sites in a period of about uh, 10 weeks. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the, the level of agility. Both of these technologies barely existed uh, before we started the deployment and we were able to do co-design and integrated into the process flow um, in hospitals and in, in community care. <clears throat> uh, here's another example of a technology that we've been testing in a living lab. It's a small Irish startup um, called Acara from Trinity College. And what you're seeing the robot do here um, is doing ultraviolet con decontamination of radiology room. And to give you an idea of the agility, this is now working. It's a professional, this, this isn't say a, ma a major hospital in the US, this is an, a hospital in, the, in the, mid the Midlands of Ireland. But this is the technology that the team presented to me um, about a year ago. And they came in actually just with a drawing and I, I asked the team, well, can you come back with a prototype? And that's Connor McGinn um, be standing beside me. And within 48 hours, they brought this prototype into me and uh, since it has evolved and 
what we find it is five to 10 times faster than human cleaning teams. It's three times more effective and it's two and a half times cheaper. What we're finding is digital solutions are very much, we're getting 10x benefits, 10x improvement in care, 10x reduction in cost and so on. So we have a whole portfolio of uh, disruptive technologies that we're, we're managing from drone delivery to avatars to um, mobile x-ray camera technology uh, and so on. So what I'm delighted to have the opportunity to present today, I, I want to sort of offer the, the potential for you to register your solution and your technology with us if you can go to www.hsedigitaltransformation.ie, you can register your solution under the digital innovation call. And I want to finish with just a case study of, of one of the companies that um, submitted a technology to us uh, under um, our, our COVID, our digital COVID call. And that's a company called My Patient Space. And they, they are providing agile and rapid delivery of patient apps. They have built um, um, a rapid configuration, no code environment. Um, they create digital patient companion and you know, for multiple disease uh, apps. And they also provide a, a clinician interface. Uh, so we've just you know, signed off a contract uh, with my patient space that's led by an entrepreneur called Una Kearns. And we're currently have a, a fairly significant living lab uh, with Una and her team uh, covering seven, seven, seven different areas um, of clinical care from sleep to respiratory to rheumatology, hematology, oncology, chronic kidney disease and cancer clinical studies. And this is very much on the way. One of the key trends that we know is patient taking co-responsibility for their care. Um, we, we think this product will be a game changer uh, for allowing uh, patients to, or empowering patients to take better care of themselves. And we think there will be uh, very significant uh, patient uh, outcomes. So uh, I wanted to you know, finish. Um, you are mainly small companies, but actually small companies can have a really big impact. And um, Ilya Prijonin, uh, he says, in an unstable complex system, small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. So I, I'd encourage you to uh, work with us in, in the HSE uh, to see if there's a, a pathway for adoption uh, of your solution and you can, you can register your solution at hsedigitaltransformation.ie. Thank you and I'll hand you back to you. Then. Thank you very much, Martin. That was a, a, an excellent uh, presentation and uh, an excellent opportunity for SMEs to uh, register their technologies and their solutions with you. So uh, hopefully they will take you up on that offer. There was a question in the chat. Um, uh, there was a question. Where is it now? Yeah, Yunin, we had John who asked, um, has COVID-19 yes. made it easier or more difficult for startups to enter the complex healthcare market with innovative products? Did you get that, Martin? I did, yeah. I, I would think it's easier because um, the barrier for adoption of digital solutions has gone down dramatically. In, in, un, unfortunately, sorry, healthcare systems are designed to actually minimize variation. So... This is one of the reasons why it's, it's very difficult to, you know, penetrate, say, an organization like the HSC. Uh, but with the coming of COVID, it really dropped the barriers. Necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, so we, we needed to kind of break the glass ceiling around digital innovations. And now that we have created these pathways for digital innovation, it's easier for uh, other startups to follow in those paths. So I think it's certainly easier. And... We've proven the business case for digital, uh, so it's it's definitely um, you know um, a more promising landscape for for entrepreneurs now. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. Uh, Alice, Alison, were there any other questions that I missed there? No, nope, that's everything now, Union. Okay, so that's great, and uh, thanks again, Martin. And um, if anybody else has any questions, please put them in the, the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. And uh, if there are any outstanding at the end, we'll, we'll try to deal with them. Um, so we'll uh, proceed now to uh, a case study of a growing SME, sort of typical of some of the types of companies we just mentioned there. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, 
Uh, Andrew Cameron has navigated some of that ter territory already, and he is the founder of Fieldtech, um, and he has a, a product called Tight All Right. So I'll uh, hand you over to Andrew. Uh, thanks very much, Ian. Um, can you see my slides? Okay. Can can see them all right. It's not not in present. Yes, no, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Yes. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Andrew Cameron. Um, I'm the CEO of Fieldtech which is a connected health startup based in Galway. And hopefully I can put a little bit of what the previous speakers have mentioned today into context, um, just from the perspective of our own commercialization journey. So we're developing Titerite, which is a connected health technology for providing disruptive improvements to wound care. And we began our journey in the BioInnovate Island program, where we spent 10 months identifying unmet clinical needs making thousands of observations in numerous Irish hospitals, as well as the Mayo Clinic in the USA. Uh, it was during our time in these hospitals that we met a number of patients who had terrible wounds on their legs, and some had been present for over 30 years, treated but never healed. So this is where we first witnessed the harsh reality of venous leg ulcers. These painful chronic wounds affect 11.5 million people globally each year, causing extreme social, psychological, and physical impacts on patients and severely affecting their quality of life. They're caused by a failure of the veins in the leg, um, which results in pooling of fluid and a breakdown of tissue. So 50%, 56% of these wounds have delayed healing and 30% of ulcers don't actually heal within a year. This is despite the availability of a gold standard treatment, compression therapy. The ability of compression to restore venous flow is essential for effective healing. In fact, studies have actually shown that there's a linear relationship between the pressure applied and healing rates. Unfortunately, in reality, it's just not that easy. Currently, there's a 90% failure to achieve targeted pressure in clinical practice. Even if you apply the correct amount of pressure, you can lose up to 50% within the first 72 hours because of a reduction in swelling and non-compliance rates are up to 80% in the community settings. Furthermore, the recent COVID pandemic has left many patients without their usual provision of care, providing a 20-fold increase in the risk of hospitalization. The average cost of treating a venous leg ulcer in Germany is 8,660 euros, just to give you an indication of how much these cost. And 80% of this is actually related to the nurse's time. These wounds are consuming 1% of all healthcare spending in industrialized nations. What's even more concerning is that recent studies have shown that in the last five years, the number of venous leg ulcers have doubled while healing rates have decreased by 20%. Essentially, hospital systems are unable to cope with the prevalence and lack of trained personnel. So there's a critical need for a way to increase healing rates and reduce workload in venous leg ulcer treatment will reduce costs and improved patient outcomes. To address this unmet need, Fieldtech has developed Titerite, the first connected health technology for measuring and monitoring compression therapy. The point of care solution includes a wearable device and mobile app, ensuring consistent application of gold standard compression, thereby reducing healing times. A supporting digital platform enables remote monitoring, self-management and digital optimization of care thereby reducing workloads. Fieldtech's IP strategy includes a pipeline of patents aimed at protecting a leading position in the market for monitoring wound treatments. This not only includes the unique device design, which enables wearability, accuracy, and comfort to the patient, but also the data transfer system, which facilitates capture, processing, and correlation of multiple factors of wound treatment in an anonymized and consented manner. We intend to be the leading company for delivering data-driven solutions in the wound market. Based on preliminary data, we predict a 30% reduction in healing time, a 34% reduction in intervention frequency, and a 53% reduction in treatment costs, as well as a significant improvement to the patient's quality of life. The point of care te technology is superior to any existing competitors, such as inaccurate tension indicators, or impractical and expensive handheld devices. While the digital platform provides unparalleled capabilities to remotely monitor and optimize treatment. The market value for Titerite in the USA and Europe is 1.4 billion euros. But this does not include other indications that use compression therapy, including lymphedema or other regions of interest, such as Asia. 
Furthermore, there's huge additional value to the data captured, demonstrated by the explosion in the market for health analytics and the steady growth of the market for digital wound monitoring. Our B2B model will sell a combination of hardware and software products to our target customers who represent multi-site integrated care organizations, allowing for rapid scaling with value-based outcome reimbursement models. Our target users are delayed healing patients and we're already developing strategic partnerships with large multinational wound companies who represent potential market channels or exit opportunities. We're already in negotiations with two major players for joint development projects, which are currently under confidentiality agreements. From our financial projections, we anticipate that by 2025, we'll be generating over 10 million euros in annual revenue with a gross margin of 59% and a net profit of 44%. We're currently closing a seed round of 900,000 euros to enter the US market with Beachhead customers as a class one technology in Q4 of 2021. We intend our seed round to be made up of a combination of private investors and support from Enterprise Island through their high potential startup scheme. We're also exploring other match funding opportunities such as investment through the Western Development Commission. We've already commenced work with a number of high profile US key opinion leaders to support this market entry and subsequent rounds of 2 million euros and 3.5 million euros will finalize the digital platform and position the full technology suite for scalable launch in targeted markets across the USA and Europe, including Germany, Netherlands, and the UK. To date, we've been very fortunate to be supported by a number of Irish and European agencies, starting with Enterprise Ireland. From day one, they were supporting the BioInnovate program where we identified the unmet clinical need they then provided the, the funding for the commercialization fund to develop the clinical, commercial, and technical elements of the project um, within NUI Galway. Once we left the university, we entered the company full-time and EI continued their support with the competitive start fund, as well as other mechanisms. I should point out that the Westpic were a huge asset in helping us to prepare for these submissions to the EI schemes, such as the CSF and the HPSU and we're extremely grateful for their contribution to our success with these opportunities. EIT Health were another big support for us with multiple mechanisms. Head Start was our company's first injection of direct funds. Their mentoring programs are great and currently we're running, with a number, we're, we're running for a number of European wide opportunities with Catapult and the BP 2022 Consortium. The NDRC Accelerator Program, which is now run by Dogpatch Labs, not only provided valuable mentoring and bridge funding, it also expanded our network in the digital space and helped refine our business model with new perspectives. The Health Innovation Hub Island is an awesome resource for healthcare startups, helping to connect innovations into the Irish healthcare system. They were instrumental in helping us achieve our first clinical validation, which has been invaluable in our commercialization journey. Some of the other opportunities that we've utilized include international accelerator programs, such as H+, which gave us great insights into the, into the German healthcare market, as well as inter-trade island seed corn competition. For any startups looking to write a business plan or refine their existing business plan, this competition and the associated coaching will help immensely. We're about to enter our third year and just going through the process has strengthened our proposal orders of magnitude each time. Internally, we're backed by an experienced and well-rounded management team. I have a background in tissue engineering and research commercialization. Darren has a background in medtech quality and R&D. Gary is professor of anatomy at NUI Galway. And Stuart has 20 plus years of commercial healthcare experience, including executive roles in numerous multinational companies. Our advisors include a panel of internationally recognized and respected key opinion leaders in the clinical and marketing sectors of wound care, so in summary, Venus Leg Ulcers represents a large and growing market, providing an unsustainable economic burden to global healthcare systems. Titerite is the first connected health technology for providing disruptive improvements to venous leg ulcer treatment, enabling reduced healing times and improved efficiencies of care, which are translatable to multiple indications. Our business model will target a combination of hardware and software products at multi-site integrated care organizations starting in the USA. Today, we've reached design freeze of our point of care technology, and we've identified and costed manufacturing partners within Ireland to bring us through design for manufacturing and testing. 
We've just received our first patient data with extremely promising results for reducing burden on patients and healthcare systems. And we have a growing number of clinical and industry stakeholders that are looking to see our product market ready. Finally, we're about to close our 900,000 euro seed fund to achieve market entry of our point of care technology. At Filtex, we have an ambition to realize the full potential of compression therapy through safety, efficacy, and empowerment. And we're very appreciative to anyone helping us reach that ambition. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, that, that was uh, fantastic. And again, it's always refreshing to hear uh, the story from a, an entrepreneur's point of view. And uh, I hope uh, I hope things continue to work out for you. And I hope that those uh, negotiations that you're uh, going through at the moment, that they're fruitful. Uh, um, I'm, I'm just having a, a look to see, uh, or maybe Alison, is there... Is there, are there any questions in the chat or in the Q&A, There's actually no one directly for Andrew, you know, we just have one um, asking, will we get a recording of this webinar later? Okay, well, the, 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 the There is the a question for Andrew. There is a question for Andrew, but it's not in the Q&A chat. It's in the normal chat. And the question is for your, Andrew, for your production needs, will these be fully manufactured in Ireland or elsewhere? Yes, it's, it's a good question. At the moment, um, we're sort of, down to our last couple opportunities for manufacturing partners and when negotiating those contracts. Um, we are looking abroad. Um, we have a couple very qualified Irish contenders, um, but we're open to all opportunities, to be honest. So um, yeah, we, we haven't made that final decision yet. Okay. Okay, th <laughs> thanks. Uh, thanks, Ria, and thanks, Alison, and uh, thank you indeed, um, Andrew. Um, I don't think there are any other uh, questions at this point. Now, we still have some time for questions, um, but I'd like to proceed maybe with our, uh, our final section, and please hang on for this because this is very important. Uh, we have five... Um, uh, we have five SMEs and some of them are service providers as well that want to do a 30 second pitch to the, uh, to the audience here. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you who they are first and that this is the order in which they're, they're going to uh, do the 30 second pitch. I have David Egan from Core Life Analytics. Uh, I have Greer Deal from Med Didaya. I have Marlene De Vries in Avivia. I have Dermot Cahalan from European Device Solutions. And I have Nicola Wall from a Fortiori Development Limited. So um, uh, I will start right away. And I see David is, uh, is with us. So David, you've got 30 seconds to tell us about your offering. Thanks. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is David Egan. I'm the uh, CEO of Core Life Analytics. We're based here in the Netherlands in, um, uh, in Den Bosch. And what I want to talk to you today is about uh, 3D analytics for, for 3D biology. So we solve a problem in, for biologists who are using a technology called high content screening. And obviously we don't have time to go in in detail, but basically they use automated microscopy to generate images of cells. And then they use automated uh, um, uh, image analysis to generate numeric data. Here's where the problem comes in. They end up swamped with numeric data and they didn't have the tools to analyze it until we developed an online data analytics platform called Stratominer that allows biologists to analyze their own complex data. Now, one of the uh, biological technologies that is uh, being increasingly used uh, for um, uh, drug discovery and for high content screening is what we call 3D biology or organoids. Now, traditionally, uh, cells were uh, tested in, let's say, a very simple 2D uh, modular system. But increasingly, people are switching to 3D systems where you have a three-dimensional cellular structure, and these are much more physiologically relevant. Uh, so you can see the effects of cell-to-cell -cell contacts. You've better co concordance with in vivo data, um, and you can reduce animal testing. So, uh, hi, when you're... David. We're we're well over the thirty seconds at the moment. Yeah, no worries. So what we have found is we have found a, a a potential collaborator in Dublin, a service provider who we'd like to get a voucher. Uh, in order to get his services to generate some uh, data, some evaluation data and proof of principle data for 3D biology. Jeremy Simpson, he has a, a cell screening facility in uh, UCD in Dublin. Thank you very much, David. 
Thank you very much. Now, the next uh, person on our list is uh, Greer Deal from Med Di Daya. Do I have you, Greer? And I don't know if I have yes. your. Uh, do I have your you um, name proper there? Did I <laughs> yes, your name we can proper? hear you. We can okay, hear great. you. It's it's Medidia. Okay, thanks, Greer. <laughs> Maybe no David can stop sharing his screen. It's I, I don't have a presentation. I'll just talk, so that's fine. <laughs> yes, but I I, oh, I don't yeah, see like you. like to see you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Maybe David. Okay, David, could you sharing? unshare, please? Yeah. <clears throat> I know it's hard to find sometimes. It might be at the top of the screen. Yeah, in the top of the screen, it, it is. Yeah, That's great. It. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Greer, you're off you go. Thank you very much. So good morning, everyone. Every day we're having to face new diseases and new challenges to patients and our healthcare systems. It is critical that we advance medical technology to overcome these challenges and to underpin a healthcare system that we can all be proud of worldwide. So we need innovators like you. But imagine a scenario where regulations actually restrict your innovations. Please don't let regulations hold back your innovation. At Medidia, we will help you to navigate the regulatory pathway through to success and be your regulatory partners for devices, diagnostics and digital health. Thank you. Okay. okay, Greer, thank you, Good thank you very much. And we will share your de everyone's details afterwards as well with the, with the participants. So th thanks a million for that, Greer. Um, the next person we have is Marlene De Vries from Avivia. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello, um, Marlene. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Marlene. I'm a project manager at Avivia and we're located in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Um, we are an independent research organization and we're specialized in, specialized in drug formulation development. So not development of the API, but actually the formulation around it to make it a product you can put on the shelf. This includes, for example, new formulations, but also reformulation, repurposing, repositioning and deformulation of existing products or products which are no longer available for various reasons. We are a small company, only 15 FTE, um, which makes us very lean and flexible. We have both a pharmaceutical and an analytical lab, and they're both functioning at R&D level, which allows us to be very flexible and fast and to work on a broad range of projects. We are typical problem solvers and we like to work on challenging projects. And our clients range varies from universities, SMEs up to big pharma. We can manage drug development projects and can provide support for specific small parts in a client's project. But we can also do a complete development project up to marketing authorization. This webinar is a chance for us to broaden our network for both new clients, but also network partners for maybe future projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marlene. Uh, and our next uh, speaker will be uh, Dermot Cahalan from European Device Solutions. Are you with us there, Dermot? Yes. Good morning. Thank you, Yunin. Thanks morning. very much for this opportunity. It's an excellent uh, forum and a very well organized presentation so far. So I think it's been very useful to all of the participants. I just wanted to mention that the, for early stage medical technology companies, we believe it's very important to be able to fulfill three criteria. You need to be able to identify an unmet medical need, demonstrate clinical utility, and have the support and endorsement of key opinion leaders. And obviously people mention regulatory compliance, we believe that it starts earlier than that. You need to classify what kind of technology you have and determine whether or not it is actually a medical device. That links back into what we call your intended use statement, which we can help you to craft. Uh, 30 seconds is really short. So I'd just like to suggest that if anybody participating today would like some free consulting, I'm happy to offer that to any of the participants on the call today where we can get a more closer picture of what they want to do and then help them and direct them in identifying key opinion leaders, assisting them access funding and also develop a regulatory framework for their product or innovation. Thanks very much, Eunan, and well done to everybody. Okay, thanks, Jeremy. Um, and our, our last uh, 
30 second presenter is Nicola Wall from A Fortiori Development Limited. Are you are you with us there, uh, Nicola? I am. Um, thanks, Yunan. And it's lovely to see a few familiar faces. Um, hi, Andrew. <laughs> um, so I'm Nicola Wall. I'm the CEO of A Fortiori Development, and we're a full service clinical research organization. So um, in the jargon of the industry, a CRO means that we help companies to design and plan and actually effectively manage their clinical trials um, of all shapes and sizes. So we've been working with companies in the medical product development space. So that means we work with medical device companies and digital health companies and drug companies. Um, essentially, you know, helping those companies to obtain evidence that their products are safe and effective. So we are based here in the Porter Shed uh, in Galway. We also have offices in the UK and in the US. So uh, we've worked with so many wonderful companies here in the West of Ireland. And it's, uh, it's, it's great to be able to be in that position to provide that help and, and you know, work with companies on this really important journey that they're on. So I'll uh, leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. And um, I know some some of the companies that we just heard from there are uh, they are registered as service providers on the Boost for Health website. That's uh, boostforhealth.eu is the, is the website address. So any other uh, service providers that would like to offer um, offer their services to SMEs um, either in Ireland or in the European countries on the program, please uh, register on, on that website. Thank you very much. So thanks to all who made the, the pitches there. Um, we've, uh, we've really come to the, to the end of, of, of the event, uh, but it's up to me to, to maybe to thank uh, a few people. I'd like to thank the four main speakers. Uh, that's uh, Ria, Alan, Martin and Andrew. Um, and I'd also like to thank the SMEs and service providers who just made those uh, pitches. There were some interpretations of what 30 seconds is there, but I, didn't th I think we did okay. Um, uh, I'd like to thank all of my West Westbeck colleagues that helped with this, in particular Neve and Alison and Carmel, who are doing all sorts of things behind the scenes there and were a huge support in the last few weeks leading up to this with the promotion and so on. Also our project partners who are a great support as well. And, and we have people here from lots of different countries today. Um, and uh, thanks finally to Interreg Northwest Europe, who of course are funding this project. Uh, and thanks to all of you who attended as well. So without any further ado, I'm going to finish it up with that and please enjoy the rest of your day. Bye now. Great. Thank you very much, thanks, Yunan, for thank the you. moderating this session. Good job. Uh, okay, thanks, everyone. Right, <laughs> See you soon.